Smart contracts are powerful programs that stand to disrupt every aspect of our online lives. But they're notorious for having security vulnerabilities that collectively lost users billions of dollars in 2022 alone. That's because, you know, a single line of code gone wrong can enable an attacker to steal all the money from a smart contract. And in this video, I want to teach you about a specific smart contract hacking technique that's going to let you do just that, okay? but not so that you can steal money for yourself. Okay, I never advocate for nefarious activity on this channel, but so that you can protect yourself from this and also find this and help other people get protected and you can get paid handsomely to do that. I'm gonna show you everything you need to know in this video today as a blockchain developer myself who works this technology on a daily basis. So if you're new around here, hey, I'm Gregory and on this channel, I turn you into a blockchain master. So if that's that you're interested in, then smash that like button down below for the YouTube algorithm and subscribe to this channel. And if you want to know how to become a blockchain master step-by-step start to finish, land your first blockchain developer job, increase your salary past 100K, then head on over to adaptuniversity.com forward slash bootcamp to get started today. All right, so let's get into this. Let's talk about this security vulnerability that you need to watch out for as a blockchain developer and also how to spot it. So let's start off by looking at an essential concept about how blockchains work. So again, if you're going to do anything on a blockchain, like send cryptocurrency from one account to another, anytime you do that, you're creating a transaction, and those transactions are grouped together into bundles of records called blocks, which are chained together to make up the blockchain, okay? If you go on a website like etherscan.io, okay, you can look at the latest blocks that were included in the blockchain, okay? They have a number right here, uh, which is the block height, all right? And you can see all the transactions inside of here. I'm just picking a random block. Again, 151 transactions. You can see all what they do, like a, you know, this is a token transfer, et cetera, et cetera. Anyways, we don't need to dig into all those details, but what I want to point out is that each block that's included in the blockchain um, has something called a timestamp, okay? So if you see this, uh, this tells you, you know, exactly when the block was created. And you can see that it has this nice human readable format here, all right, on the actual block explorer where you can see the time ago and the actual date uh, with the time zone offset and all that type of stuff, okay? But that's not really how the number is stored in the actual blockchain itself. So um, it uses something called, you know, Unix time or Epic time or Epoch time, depending on how you want to say it. There's all different ways to pronounce this word. But basically, this is a common computing standard that basically takes, uh, you know, a, num a, a date in uh, January 1st, 1970, and tells you the number of seconds that have elapsed since that date in the past, and that helps you determine what the current date is. And so, you know, this website, you can just look at epicconverter.com, will show you what the current time is with an epic timestamp. All right, you can play around with this to see what this looks like. It'll even tell you more about, you know, how this works if you want to learn more. But basically, this number right here is just a value of the current time expressed in seconds. And this is how blockchains create timestamps uh, whenever they're going to, you know, create a transaction and, and put it into a block. OK, so uh, you can access this value inside of your smart contracts whenever you are uh, coding them. And if you look at the Solidity documentation, you can see that right here. OK. So block.timestamp will give you the current timestamp of the block um, that your transaction is going to get included into. OK, you can see it's a, uh, you know, an epic timestamp, like I just showed you a second ago, a second since the Unix epic. OK, it's an unsigned integer. It's just a number. It's expressed in seconds. So you can see the other Solidity global variables here uh, that you might be familiar with, like message.sender, all right, message.value. All right, all that type of stuff. But block timestamp is the one that we're going to be concerned with in this particular vulnerability. So why would you want to use block.timestamp inside your smart contracts? Well, there's lots of different reasons. The most common use case is when you need to determine the current time on the blockchain and then enforce some rules inside your smart contracts based on the current time. So example might be like a token time lock. Maybe you want to send somebody tokens and put them in a smart contract and say, hey, you can only withdraw these six months from now. Well, we can use a timestamp that's exactly six months in the future and not let you, you know, withdraw your tokens until that has elapsed on the, on the blockchain. Other reasons might be minting NFTs, like you have an NFT drop at a certain date in the future, and then you code that value into your smart contract, and then people can only mint the NFTs once that date has passed, okay? Another significant uh, way is for random number generation or pseudo-random number generation, okay? And a whole lot more. Now, this is one that I want to focus on because this is an example of where the vulnerability comes into play. All right, so let's get us some code to see how this actually works and then spot the vulnerability and talk about how to fix it, okay? 
So head on over to remix.ethereum.org. You could just go to the contracts tab here, okay, and then create a new contract with this create file here. I've just created one called mycontract.soul. I'll put a couple different code examples in here and I'll leave links down in the description below so that you can grab the final code solution uh, to implement this yourself, okay? So let's first start off and talk about, you know, block timestamp and look at a value use case and then talk about the vulnerability, okay? We'll just look at how it works first and then we'll talk about how it can be manipulated. So let's first, let's look at maybe an example like this, like NFT minting, just using the block timestamp to compare uh, dates in the future and in the past. So the first thing we want to do is create a state variable that that gets some date in the future. So I'm going to go to this uh, epicconverter.com and I'm going to take, you know, something that's a month in the future. So I'm just going to take the current date and then do one month in the future. Okay. And then I'm going to human to date stamp. All right. And it will tell me the uh, time in seconds. That's what we want, not milliseconds. This is like for JavaScript. This is for Solidity. Okay. And then I'm going to go back to Remix. I'm going to say uint256 uh, timestamp. We'll also say uh, mint date equals this. And then we're going to say mint time. That's probably more accurate. And then I'm going to create a function uh, for minting NFTs. Now, this is going to be just a pseudo function. Okay. It's not really going to be complete. But I'm just going to create a function that, you know, you can pretend that what the function is actually going to do is let people create NFTs from scratch because that's what typically what happens inside of, you know, NFT drops. Okay, so function mint uh, is public. A user can call it and they can send an ether with this transaction in order to mint the NFT. So inside of here, what I want to do is prevent any users from um, calling this function until one month in the future. So we'll pretend that our NFT drop is going to happen one month from now. Okay, and so basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to say require... Okay, the require function inside Solidity is what lets you uh, evaluate an expression as true or false. And if the expression evaluates is true, you can continue function execution. And if not, you can uh, basically stop execution of the function and revert. So what I'm going to do inside of here is say block.timestamp. Okay, that's the global variable we saw in Solidity before. Uh, is greater than or equal to a mint time. And what that's going to do is say like, hey, uh, you know, the block timestamp must be bigger than the mint time. And when you know that, that number has actually gotten bigger than the mint time, you'll know that you've passed this and you're now in the future relative to this. And that will make it valid. And you can actually call the function. So uh, this gets kind of confusing when you're trying to read it about it logically. So I think one of the best ways to illustrate this is to just look at a JavaScript console. Okay. Basically, we can just take our mint time from the uh, smart contract and assign it to a variable here. And then basically, you know, copy this number. All right, let's decrease it by one. All right, and then compare it. So is it greater than or equal to the mint time? All right, no, it's false. Let's increase it by one so that it's equal to. All right, then you'll know you've achieved this date. All right, it's true. And then we're going to go up by one. All right, so 870. Let's just do... All right, then boom, it's true. So that's how you can sort of logically reason about it by actually using... Uh, some coding tools to help you visualize that. All right, now here's where the problem comes in with block.timestamp, okay? This is not a completely accurate th source of truth for the current time on the blockchain. Now, let me explain why. Because essentially, whenever these blocks are proposed onto the blockchain, uh, whoever's, you know, including the block, or proposing the block, I should say, uh, has some ability to change this value slightly okay so let me explain what i mean by that all right so here's where the problem lies so whenever you know somebody's proposing a block you know block not timestamp you know, the, the timestamp for the block really should be you know monotonic it should be increasing uh, in a predictable fashion but there actually is some variance in this okay as long as it falls within a few constraints. So the first constraint is that it, of course, must be bigger than the parent, okay? And so if you look at Etherscan, you can see that in the most recent two blocks, okay? You can see this block timestamp, uh, you know, and this block timestamp, and of course, this one must be bigger than this one because of how they are linked together. Now, the second thing is, you know, it should not be too far in the future, though, from the parent, okay? So there's a little bit of tolerance on this. So, you know, if your block is a few seconds, uh, larger than the parent, that makes sense because that's sort of in like a reasonable tolerance range. If it's like, you know, 100 years in the future, like that's not going to work, obviously, for lots of different reasons, but this is one of them. But as long as it's within this constraint, it actually can be manipulated, which can have catastrophic effects. And so let's look at how that works now. All right, so... If we looked at our previous example of like the NFT minting example, let's say this timestamp got manipulated. The only real side effect here is that some NFTs would be minted slightly 
uh, you know, different from the time that they should be. So that's not really a huge deal, okay? But let's look at an example where it could be terrible. Well, this comes back to the use case where people are using block.timestamp as a source of randomness, okay? So that's like this right here. So let me show you what that would look like. Here's an example of a smart contract that mimics, you know, like a lottery or a roulette wheel or something like this, okay? Basically, it has one function called play, which lets, you know, anybody call the function since it's external, sorry, excuse me, external. It also lets, it's payable, so it lets people accept ether, or lets the smart contract accept ether and people will call this function. And what you do, basically, is you call this function, you send in ether, and uh, you send in one ether and make sure that the message value, the amount of ether sending in, is exactly equal to one. And what we do is, you know, based on if, if the smart contract accepts it, and we use block timestamp as a source of randomness to say, hey, if you sort of got the lucky random number, then what we're going to do is we're going to take all the ether in the smart contract and send it to your wallet. That's exactly what it does here. Address this balance. Basically, we take that and we call, um, you know, call here on message sender, and that's going to send, you know, um, all the ether to their wallet. Okay, so. We're using block.timestamp as a source of randomness. Basically, we're saying, hey, get the current timestamp and then, um, you know, divide it by seven and get the remainder. And if this number is perfectly divisible by seven, then we're going to send you the money. All right. That's what this is. This is the mod modulo operator, uh, which basically divides by this number and it says it returns the remainder. So if the remainder is zero, then that means that, hey, it's a, it's perfectly divisible by this number right here, or said another way that this number is a factor of this number, okay? So um, that's what we're doing here. Basically, we're kind of using block.timestamp as a random number generator to say, hey, if you picked a random number, then, then we'll send you the ether. Now, that's where the vulnerability comes into play, because if whoever is proposing the block uh, has some ability to manipulate this number slightly, all right, in any given direction, as long as it satisfies, you know, these criteria, like, you know, uh, excuse me, these criteria right here, that it's at least bigger than the parent block and it's not too far in the future. If you could just simply bump this number by one second, all right, and it still satisfies those initial criteria, that could let, you know, uh, somebody who's proposing the block uh, essentially manipulate this and drain the contract balance. And so that's just one common example of where the vulnerability might come into play is if you're trying to use this as a source of randomness. Now, what's the solution to this? Well, number one is you should not be using block timestamp for this purpose, okay? Uh, there's, you know, smart contracts in general are notorious for being bad at random number generation. What could you use instead? Well, you could something like Chainlink, all right? Chainlink has a verifiable random number generator, okay? So Chainlink is a decentralized Oracle network. There's different reasons why you want to use Chainlink. Let's say you want to get the price of cryptocurrency on chain. We need an Oracle for something like that or the weather or any stock price data. They also let you do verifiable random numbers sent directly to your smart contracts, which has a huge application like in gaming, for example. All right. So one question I'm seeing a lot is, does this vulnerability still matter after the Ethereum merge? Because before the Ethereum merge, Ethereum was running proof of work. You know, now after the merge, it's running proof of stake. And so before the merge, you know, the common vulnerability essentially was uh, that miners could manipulate the block timestamp, especially if they had enough hash power. But after the Ethereum merge, um, you know, the consensus mechanism works slightly differently. So my understanding is that it's not the exact same as it was before the merge and how this is manipulated, but that it is still a vulnerability that you should steer clear of, okay? And so if you're a developer and you're not sure, you should really avoid this entirely for, you know, purposes aside of uh, comparing dates in the past and future for a couple different reasons. You know, number one is if you're not sure whether it's vulnerable, then you probably just shouldn't do it in the first place, okay? Number two is that if their smart contract is deployed to a different network later, let's say the application expands to a different blockchain that still uses proof of work but uses smart contracts and it would obviously be vulnerable in the same way that it was before like there's lots of different evm compatible chains that can run solidity smart contracts you never totally know exactly where your code's going to end up and you definitely want to steer clear of any place where it might be vulnerable all right so if you want to find vulnerabilities just like this and get paid for hacking smart contracts then how can you get started well, definitely you can check out bug bounty platforms like immunefy.com. Again, it's not a sponsored video or anything like that. This is just my personal recommendation. There's other ones out there, but I do like what immunefy has been doing. And you can explore all the bounties to see who's going to pay you to find vulnerabilities in their smart contracts. I mean, like this line of wormholes got a $10 million bug bounty. Okay, that's pretty hefty. Okay, 
but you can see like uh, you know GMX got a five million dollar bug bounty, you know, all the way down to you know many uh, other bounties that are you know still you know, like a hundred thousand dollars, a million dollars. There's there's lots of opportunities out there. Okay. So this is one more tool that you can add to your tool belt when you're looking for these things. All right, so that's an overview of the block.timestamp security vulnerability, how to spot it, and how to also uh, protect yourself from this and how to disclose to other people in case it's an issue for them, and then you can get paid to do that. So I hope you like this video. You know, as always, smash that like button down below for the YouTube algorithm. Subscribe to this channel if you haven't already. And if you like or just want to go for the throat and really upgrade your smart contract development skills so that you can become a security auditor, bug bounty expert, just solidity guru, whatever, all right, you can go to my YouTube homepage. You can find those free courses there. They like you to be courses, but they're totally free. And if you like those or you, you want to take the next step or, hey, maybe take a master stroke entirely, you know, actually become a blockchain master, step-by-step -step start finish, land your first blockchain developer job, increase your salary, pass 100K over at adaptiveworks.com forward slash bootcamp. Again, you don't have to be an expert to get started today. Tell people with zero coding experience become real-world blockchain developers in a matter of months. So that's all I've got. Until next time, thanks for watching Dapiversity.